So this symposium is in honor of Deborah Rawlson. And Deborah, for many years, worked, maybe all her life, has worked on causes that are unpopular. And there are two interpretations of causes that are unpopular. One is that they're just a bad idea. And that's, I think, a lot of what goes on in science. I mean, people work on stuff that's not very popular. It turns out it's because it's not a very good idea. But there are a smaller number of people who work on ideas that are unpopular at the time they work on them, but subsequently turn out to be really good ideas later. These are people with some vision of what the future can be. And Deborah falls in that latter category. It's the work that she's done on particularly electrically conducting high surface area solids was at a time when she started doing it, when people were doing other things, you can argue, more or less sexy. But they've turned out to be, I think, the foundation for what's going to be a really important part of not just modern electrochemistry, but modern um, solid state science. So she was right on that one. And then, of course, the work that she's done on diversity is absolutely correct. At the time she started, it was not at all clear what she was arguing for. The way that she was arguing for it is, was the best way of doing it. But I think that everyone now agrees that the American cha changes in the American workforce are all for the better. And I think she deserves credit for sticking with that, even in a period in which not everyone loved you for what you were doing. <laughs> so congratulations, Deborah. Two good causes. And it really has made a difference to science. Now I'm going to talk about something that has nothing to do with electrochemistry. Nothing, whatever. <laughs> so those of you who are here under the wrong impression, feel free to leave, but do it in a way that makes a social statement because it's more fun that way. <laughs> Let me start by saying something about the people who did it. We're going to talk about density. And I just want to point out the names because sometimes they disappear into the past. Kat Marika was Russian. And she started, she is, she started this work <coughs> and some other stuff on paper diagnostics with Scott Phillips. And as a Russian, her view of the world was invariably bleak. And she and I had a conversation at some point and I said she should really consider adopting a kind of California girl of view of relentless optimism, which she did, and what's, what I'm going to tell you about now has come out of that point of view. So this is social engineering at its best. Saving Su and Nathan Shapiro have done some of the work on, on bio, and then Charlie Mason, A.J. Kumar on the two-phase polymer systems, if I get there, and then a bunch of other people that I'll mention as I go along. Now, the motivation for this area, first, <coughs> new tools. Uh, in general, new tools are interesting and you can do things with them and they make new kinds of science possible. And the characteristics that we're particularly interested in for reasons having to do with other projects is that we want tools that have the characteristics that they don't cost anything and they're really simple. That's for use in developing world applications and a number of other things of that sort. So what we want to do and what we're going to do here is to take all of this stuff and we're going to convert it into that. Now, it's going to be a different kind of measurement, but that's the basic idea. The strategy that we're going to use is to take advantage of density and magnetic levitation. The reason for density is that everything has it. You know, it is the characteristic of matter. It's universal. All matter has a density. And universal characteristics turn out to be good ones to measure in interesting ways. So what I want to show you is some interesting ways of measuring density that are new. And then there are a wide variety of applications. I can't say that we have yet found the thing that is going to make this a big deal, and it may never happen. We may not have Deborah's perspective on the world. But I'll give you a hint of where to go. So let me start by giving you just some basic principles of operation. 
If I have a diamagnetic object, a sphere here, and I suspend it in a paramagnetic liquid in a, the vicinity of a magnet, there's a magnetic field gradient extending upward from the surface of the magnet. And for reasons that I'll come to in just a moment, that tends to push this diamagnetic object away, assuming that it's a little bit more dense than the fluid, and gravity put, tends to pull it down. So if you have these two forces, a gravitational force down and a magnetic force up balancing, the thing will sit in mid-solution, otherwise levitate. Very familiar phenomenon. The question is, how can you use it? But I point out that the, the components are really straightforward. You just need a magnet, and what we use is a, a couple of centimeters square a neodymium iron boride magnet, and then a paramagnetic medium, and pretty much anything works, and a diamagnetic object. So the, the issues here, my student who put this together did this business of fading in the uh, captions, and it drives me crazy, but that's neither here nor there. Here is a plot which gives you an idea of one of the simplifications we can make here. This is the magnetic susceptibility of a bunch of stuff running from ferric ion, these are all paramagnetic, down to copper sulfate here. These are all the diamagnetic things that you can think of. Basically, everything that's diamagnetic is the same value of magnetic susceptibility. They're all the same number. It's not quite true. You get over here, and there's um, graphite, and then there are a couple of other things that are a little bit more diamagnetic, but fundamentally, you can assume that everything that you're interested in that is diamagnetic has the same value of magnetic susceptibility. All paramagnetic things are different. All diamagnetic things are the same in their magnetic properties. So what we want to do is to design a magnetic field system that gives us useful analytical results. And the particular design that we use is to take these two magnets and put them in what's called the anti-Helmholtz configuration so that the north poles are facing one another. And that means that the magnetic field skews out like this. And more importantly, it means that in this region between here and here, there's a linear gradient in magnetic field. So the magnetic field goes linearly. And you can down here see the terms that are important. And the gravitational component comes from the volume, either here or there, gravitational constant, and then the difference in density of the medium and the sample. And then you have another term over here, which is the difference in magnetic susceptibilities of these things, and again, the volume, and a B cross uh, del B term. That's important only in the sense that what it says is that the effects that we're going to see go as the magnetic field squared, not as the magnetic field. We, we don't take advantage of that, but it is an option for the future. So if you plot this out using COMSOL, here is the kind of result that you get where right in the middle, there's no magnetic field. It gets more intense as you go toward the surface, and it sort of goes out here. We call this a magnetic bottle. There's a little magnetic region in the center where the magnetic fields is, uh, where the magnetic field gradient is essentially zero. So here's the magnetic field gradient in the right configurations, and there'll be a little variation from this, but it's close enough to that. All right. If you look then at what happens when you simplify some of this constant magnetic field and so on, the height at which something will levitate here is related to the difference in uh, densities and the difference in magnetic susceptibilities times some other things that are involved there. Now, what I'm going to show you are in this anti-Helmholtz configuration is something where the North Pole faces the North Pole. I just want for the future to note the fact that if you run north to south, you can get much more intense magnetic fields and field gradients in this region and levitate heavier, heavier materials. However, the analytical chemistry is a little bit less straightforward because the relationship between position and magnetic field is nonlinear in that case, and that's just a technical detail. So what's the device? This is actually what we use most. It's just here are the magnet here and here a little frame around it. Here's the one where we use for when we're talking about the developing world. It's a carpenter's clamp where we've glued the magnets top and bottom, and then you put the cuvet in between, and you can adjust things if you want. So really, really simple. But you can do an amazing amount of stuff with this. Now, solutions, the only thing to note here is that 
you can get a wide variety of solutions. As you know, transition metal salts come in all different flavors. We usually use gadolinium and manganese because they're cheap, they're non-toxic, and they're transparent. But if you want something that's biocompatible, you tie up, let's say, gadolinium with a chelating agent. This is actually used in vivo, and it's very compatible with biological systems. You can use non-polar, non-aqueous solvents, so gadolinium and methanol. You can use non-aqueous solvents, so you take this material, and it will go very nicely in toluene. And then there are a number of other things that you can, you can use. And here's an example. So you take gadolinium, gadolinium chloride in, in water, and these are fairly concentrated solutions, a bunch of polymers in this particular case. You dump it in, in the absence of the magnetic field, some sink, some float, and then you put this in the magnetic field, and these are the stable levitation heights from which you can measure the densities. Now, what about size, you say? And so long as this gradient is linear, one nice feature of this is that the levitation height is independent of the size. So here is a large bead of something, and there is a tiny bead of something in somewhat different circumstances, and they're floating at exactly the same height. So all you need to know is the center of the thing, the size doesn't make a difference. Now, the size does make a difference when you get to very small things. And what I'm showing you here is simply the time uh, required in these particular experiments to get stable levitation for a bunch of things that are small. So at seven or eight microns, it takes an hour or so to accumulate these in a stable position here. But by the time you get to something that's one micron, which is an important number because it's the size of a cell, what you find is basically Brownian motion smears this out forever, the, the field gradient. The forces are just not big enough to overcome the collisions from thermal activation. So there are two kinds of measurements you can make here. The one that's certainly easiest is to take one of these samples and you put in two objects of known density and you use those simply as a reference and you extrapolate between them. If you know that density and you know this density and you know there's a linear relationship, you put something else in between, you simply measure the position relative to those and you're there. And you don't actually need to know even the concentrations very much then. The relative measurements are very good. You can also do this in a situation in which you don't use reference objects. You know the concentration, you know the geometry, you know all the rest of that. The difference is here you have to know the physics here, you don't have to know the physics. So it's easier, also more accurate. What is the accuracy? And these, this is really pretty interesting. What the blue bars here, and you just need to take any one of these, let's, let's take this one. The blue bar is the density of a object that we buy from a density standard laboratory. And then the red bar is a measurement done using two reference beads and the white bar is a measurement done carefully using an absolute measurement. And you can see that they come out really very well, but over here what's interesting is to look at the density. And this is density error, and this is 0 0.00002 or something like that. These are very precise measurements um, given the way we're doing them, but they're very precise measurements regardless. What else can we levitate? This is the part I like best. Water, put water in an organic. Oil, there's a drop of oil, so liquids. Milk, uh, rice, peanut butter, string cheese, honey, ketchup, crystals of some kind, and aspirin. Now, that's actually an interesting group because let me just take a couple of them. The, the cheese, or if you like uh, peanut butter. Peanut butter is a good choice because, it, particularly if you like chunky, it's heterogeneous. So how would you measure the mean density of a chunk of something that's heterogeneous, waxy, and you, know, you couldn't get it into a tube, you can't do much else with it? Big deal. String cheese is the same thing. I'll show you a use for this aspirin just a little bit later. Milk is interesting because, for example, in much of the world, milk is sold on the basis of butter fat. So a very simple method of measuring butter fat is actually a big, big help to farmers who are trying to understand how to price their milk. Here's another interesting real world example. Kerosene and diesel fuel. Why does anybody care? The answer is, in India, the government subsidizes kerosene as cooking oil. 
It's used for heating and for cooking. But diesel fuel is what one uses to power the ubiquitous diesel cars and whatever trucks and things like that. So what people do is they take the kerosene, which is subsidized, and put it in the diesel, and then they sell the diesel at diesel prices. So you go up to about 5%, save some money. It wrecks the diesel engine. And so it also increases pollution enormously. So it's a, it's a major problem. So what would be a point of sale method of doing this? And here's 100% diesel with zero kerosene in an appropriate system. Here's 0% diesel with 100% kerosene. And here's the kind of number that you look at, 90% diesel and 10% kerosene. So we do a little bit of engineering, and this just makes the case that if you put the rev you use a reference bead here, and you put a fuel sample in, if they're in the same thing, they tend to stick to one another. So you just have a little two-port cell where these, the fluid in here can communicate, but the reference bead and the fuel sample can't. You make the reference sample the value that you expect for 95% uh, diesel, 5% kerosene, and then measure it. And here's the kinds of numbers that you can get, the levitation height and the percent kerosene in a sample. And if you're interested in 5%, it's, you know, it's a couple of millimeters and easily detectable by eye. That corresponds to a 0 0.002 number in difference in density. And then the authenticating pharmaceuticals, if you go to particularly Africa, but also a lot of India, and you buy a drug, and it says on the outside Lilly or GSK or something like that, you have no guarantee of what's in this stuff. 50% of them are completely made up. So it's a major problem, not just in fraud, but also in compliance. If you're in TB medication or AIDS, you really, really, really need to take your medication every day. And when you buy it, and what it says is it's the right stuff, but it's not, you're, you're doing the right thing as a patient, but, and you're paying somebody for a medication, and what you're getting is, is sugar. And so how do you tell? And this is not a perfect way of doing it, but what you can often tell is, for, particularly from a given manufacturer, uh, and particularly for a first world manufacturer, their quality control is really very good. So ibuprofen from a reputable manufacturer will always have the same density because it's made the same way. And if you take your thing of ibuprofen and your thing comes down here, that says it's not the same thing. Now you've got to figure out what's going on. And if it turns out to be density matched, that doesn't perfectly say it is the right thing, but it's a very, very simple method of making this kind of analysis. And here are more of these, not important. And here's another sort of interesting problem. This is, again, important in the pharmaceutical industry. One of the problems in pharmaceuticals is the, the uh, uh, polymorph problem. So you make something, you crystallize it, and if there are a number of polymorphs, you have to have quality control over polymorphism for the reason that a different polymorph will have different solubility, different rates of solubilization, and hence by different bioavailability. And there's some real horror stories about not controlling polymorphism. So how do you take a 100 micron crystal and tell that it's the right polymorph? And the answer is you put it in here. Here's one phase of one of these things, and here's another phase of one of these things. They differ by 0. Let's see, 0.1 to 0.68. In this particular case, it's point, uh, you're getting on toward 0. 0.02, so it's a reasonably large difference. But very easy to tell. You just put in these little crystals, let them separate, and you pull out different polymorphs based on density. Hard to do otherwise. And this is one of my favorites. How many of you know what glitter is? Glitter. It turns out that most crime, much of crime involves sex, and much of sex involves eyeshadow, and eyeshadow has glitter. And glitter is little bits of shiny stuff that goes in in this, and it's apparently ubiquitous in crime scenes. And so you're a forensics guy, and you want to figure out what, you know, what can you make of these little specks of glittery stuff that you find. And so what you see here is a bunch of different forms of glitter, uh, and you know, this is a density standard, that's a, no, I'm sorry, this is a density standard, that's a density standard, and here's the glitter. And so you take, simply take this stuff, and these are 100 micron pieces, you put them in, you suspend them, and you can separate them very nicely. Here they are. You get their density, you get their shape, and from that you can usually do a comparison to tell who manufactured them, which tells you in turn what maker it was, which tells you what CVS is to go to to start asking who's been buying things. I mean, the, the people who do this are actually pretty interested in it. We have another one 
which comes from the the Los Angeles South Coast Crime Commission or something like that, which is the same thing with gunpowder. But it, these are just examples of uses. Now, lest you get the impression that I've gone completely over to the dark side, let me give you a legitimate scientific demonstration that we can still do that and it'll have equations, even more elaborate equations than Henry had, so it's going to be okay. So this particular thing is, what we do is, <clears throat> we basically like to do the kind of measurement you do in a spectrophotometer in binding, but to do it with no apparatus. And the, the model system that we're working through is a bead in which we know the density. We label the bead with a, a ligand, and then what we do is we put in a protein or the other way around. This particular one has the protein on the inside and the ligand on the outside. What we've been doing more intensively is to put the ligand on the inside and then, no, I'm sorry, this is right. The ligand goes on the inside and then the protein diffuses in. And so here's the density. Uh, if you have a ligand here which does not bind the protein very well, what happens is it doesn't, nothing happens. If you have a ligand which binds the protein, um, and what you see is as the protein binds, goes from the solution into the interior of the bead, you see a change in density. So now, here, if you look over here, you'll see this going on. Here's the beads becoming more dense. The point to look at here is 140 hours and 27 seconds. So this is slow, but I'm showing you this because it shows you the science. So what you see is the levitation height as the protein diffuses into the bead and attaches, the density of this changes, the system goes down like that, density increases. The trouble is that the interpretation of those data, height as a function of time in terms of binding constant and degree association is not trivial. I mean, you have to look at this and think about it a bit. And so what we've done is to work out a model in which we assume that the protein partitions with a a, a co partition coefficient into the inside of the gel, then diffuses to where there is a free ligand and then binds. And this is all equilibrium in the right kind of way. And if you then work this through, it's a reaction diffusion system. A, here's the basic differential equation which you solve, and here's what you come out with when you, you, know, you do the, the math. It's done in a, it's not an analytical solution, so it's a simulation. And you get very good results, and more importantly, to take these kinds of data as a result. If you estimate from these data the binding constant of carbonic anhydrase to that ligand, you get a value of 1.5 micromolar. If you do it from fluorescence measurements, it's 0.7 micromolar, so effectively you're getting the right answer. Now, where would this actually be useful? And let me show you what I think is actually a real opportunity, although we haven't yet got the material science to work. The system that we have is using the beads that we happen to have which have a pretty small pore diameter, so that we can get carbonic anhydrase in, but we can't get immunoglobins in. So what we would like to do is this experiment, but with immunoglobins rather than with carbonic anhydrase. What we've done here is to take a bunch of beads, color-coded, we put a bunch of different ligands on, and then we put carbonic anhydrase in. And what you see is that each bead, the time dependence of the density with each bead corresponds to its binding constant. Now, if we could take a bunch of beads and put a bunch of ligands in, which enabled us to look at a bunch of different immunoglobins, we should be able to take a drop of blood and a very finger prick level of blood and do a series, a parallel series of immunoglobin detection experiments in, in real time. That would be a really big deal because this is, you know, that would be something you would do here with $100,000 worth of apparatus. This would be doing it with two bucks. So, we have made one step in this, and the details are not important here. I just want to say that if you look at the opposite experiment, which is dissociation rather than association, the same, you can get the same kinds of data in the course of 10 minutes rather than the course of you know, 100 a month or 100 hours or whatever it is. So we'll get there. This is, we know enough about this system now in basic biophysics to know how to manipulate it. Now let me just finish by giving you one other density-based measurement. Now this, this is a technique we've come across recently, we've developed recently, it's very interesting. I'm actually very excited by this. What we have here are systems that some of you will be familiar with which are called aqueous two-phase systems. That is, you take water and you put 90% water and 10% dextran together and you get something that's 90% water. 
much time do I have? Okay. Uh, and then you do the same thing with polyethylene glycol. And so you have two phases, both of which are 90% water. You put them together, you get two phases, they're completely immiscible, even though they're 90% water. Those are interesting systems. They're very biocompatible. They've been used in the past extensively for positioning of proteins. What I show you here is a system in which we make an upper phase and lower phase, and in this particular case, the two phases are differ by 0 0.002. So the difference in density between the upper phase and the lower phase is 0 0.002, but it's a sharp, stable mm -hmm. interface. So we can make stable point gradients, step gradients, where I don't think there's any real difference, any real lower limit to what we could do there in terms of density. We can probably make them at 0 0.0001. We haven't tried to do that yet. And then what you do is put in objects of different density and they just, you know, go, they, they will go down until the density of the lower phase is higher than the density of the object, at which point they stop. So the, the old way of doing it was partitioning and a lot of literature work, particularly by a Swedish scientist named Albertson, was put together to develop the sort of basic polymer chemistry of these systems in, in the 60s. And they've been used, as I say, for crude partitioning, but not very much for other things. So here are some examples, and this, this is one direction to go in this. Here's a system in which we have one, two, three, four, five separate phases, so six interfaces. And that means we can separate six things by density all at the same time, and that for some applications will be useful. But what we have here in particular is if you look at the distance from the meniscus, we plot the distance from where we are here to the bottom of the tube, what we get is something that looks like this constant density in here, and then at this point there's a true step on molecular scale, plus or minus capillary roughness, which let's say is in the order of probably a nanometer or less. And so we have a series of nanometer steps between these flat density regions, and you can then do separations based on that. So what is a example of a separation? One of the things you can do here, which is quite interesting, is to take very dilute uh, suspension of particles here, you centrifuge them, and in centrifuging them, you take a three-dimensional system, a three-dimensional distribution, and you focus it at a two-dimensional interface. So an example is shown here. These are, whatever I showed before, 10 microns, yeah, 10 microns dyed polystyrene beads that have been suspended and then centrifuged. And what we're seeing there by eye is 25 of these. So as you can do by eye detections at the level of probably 100 of these things, which means you can work with very small volumes of blood, for example. And here is an example of a real world use of this. What we're interested in here is quantifying the concentration of gametocyte infested erythrocytes in the blood of patients with malaria. That's important because if you are going to do triage, what you want to do is to take the patients who have high concentrations of gametocytes because they're the ones which, if they're bitten by a mosquito, are more likely to transmit the disease to the next bitee, if that's the way it works out. So what you do is to take a blood sample, you put it in, and in an appropriate system here, and you simply centrifuge it down. You can do this with a, you know, a very simple hand-driven centrifuge, but we use a, another centrifuge. And you get a system in which you get packed red cells here. These are normal erythrocytes. So as you get, if you do it correctly, you get the hemocrit. Here's the bottom phase, and the packed cells are in that. At this interface are the gametocyte-infested cells. In this top phase is nothing. At that interface are lymphocytes and other white cells. And then up here, you separate all the plasma, so they can be separated. It can be used for other uses as well. So in this particular case, what you have is a density gradient here corresponding to that, where there's a little diffusion, then a step here, and the step in that particular case is 1.080 to 1.076, so it's 0 0.004, and that is the right number to get the, the uh, gametocyte-infested parasites, uh, erythrocytes, localized, and then down to the bottom. Now, it turns out that this is probably not actually going to be useful for the reason 
that there are a number of other conditions in which the erythrocytes have a little bit higher density. So sickle cell disease and a number of the thes uh, thessalemias and things of this sort. So I'm not sure it's going to be useful for that, but our coworker, who is Diane Wirth, who is a great expert in malaria, has these systems over now in Tanzania, uh, using them for, for isolation of gametocyte-infested erythrocytes to do genetic analysis on them. So I think it'll be useful research even under those circumstances. So nothing whatever to do with electrochemistry but an equation to prove that I'm not as good a scientist as Henry White, but I try to put equations in even though if I don't understand them either. And then congratulations to you, Deborah, for this very well-deserved honor. It's a, it's a legitimate question, and I don't know. Probably not much, because the ions will be able to partition on and off. And, you know, if a polymer sticks, yeah, it might do something. You could also worry a little bit about a tiny perturbation from hydrophobicity, but I don't think that's going to be a big issue. It's a legitimate concern. But in a sense, if you get separations, you get separations. So you may have to do some empirical tinkering. Right. Yep. Yeah, the, the interfacial free energies here are fantastically small. You know, an interfacial free energy might be 0 0.0002. They're right down there with the surface of liquid helium. Now, now, in fact, you can, in some cases, with differences in hydrophobicity, see a little bit of a curvature there, so that you can see curvature, but I think the curvature effects in terms of energy are going to be small. Anyway, we're trying to look at those effects and ask whether that provides yet another factor of 10 in measuring densities, if we can, because some definitely are sort of right at the interface, some are a little bit, you know, resting on top of the interface, some are clearly sagging down into the interface, and they're bound to be energetic descriptions, analytic descriptions of that that will be useful. We just haven't worked it through. One in the front here. Uh, many people in India died because of fake I was wondering, they, they right. so they use methanol. Right. Yep. We haven't looked at that problem. It's an interesting one because the trouble is that the, the junk that goes into cheap hooch is really varied. You use whatever is around. So you use ethanol, you use various kinds of fusel oil, you use all kinds of things with different densities. And I'd have to look at the problem to find out whether there's a common thing that is commonly used as a diluent. If that's true, it might be okay. But there's also the issue with, with uh, um, drinks, that they, they range quite a lot in terms of their ethanol water ratio anyway. So I would guess that that's a less promising way of doing this than to do some kind of chemical method that would, would detect the, uh, the dilutants in some other way. But it's an interesting problem, and I'm, since I'm very interested in drinking, I intend to look at that. <laughs> If you have what? A gradient in a magnetic field. Well, you can work that out. The, the virtue of the system that we work with is that the gradient is linear, so it's very easy to do. But if you have something that's some you know, more peculiar shape, you just have to take that into account. The easy way of doing that is going to be to take a series of density standards, put it in, and then do a spline fit. That way you don't have to do an analysis, and there's going to be no discontinuities. This has to be a continuous function. So I think it'll be possible to work that out without any difficulty. It's just we haven't done it. If you were to optimize, how short do you think you can make these things work? I think it can be very fast. I mean, the, the time required to do something that's even a modest-sized piece, they reach equilibrium in seconds. So the whole system just goes chunk. It does what it's supposed to do. It's the small ones that are interesting and, and problematic. And I think there are ways of accelerating that. But what we have to do right now, particularly for the biological applications, we need to get some beads that have the characteristic that they have large pore volumes, 
uh, and are easy to work with. And the only problem with doing that is that right at the moment, we happen to be, the people who are working on this are more biophysical than synthetic organic, and they don't know how to make it. But if any of you is a, you know, a synthetic polymer chemist and you're desperately eager to take on a sort of an interesting problem, we will be eternally grateful to you. I think on that note, we close this first session. Thank you to all the speakers. We will continue at 10 after the hour.